laboratoires qui sont des, des déchets qui viennent de d'autres Une balle, deux balles, pas assez de balles, trois Un mort, de blessé, l'affaire Villanueva Un citoyen est tué par la police, fait l'effet d'un feu de bail Touché comme sujet, par en pas au bye bye Plus facile de faire référence à Montréal Noir Montréal Nord, Montréal Marne, Montréal Mort Plus d'investissement conséquent, monsieur le maire Et peut-être que Montréal Noir serait Montréal Art hein. Faut pas trop prendre les citoyens pour des caves C'est pas juste l'économie qui fait en sorte que l'heure est grave On veut te faire peur en parlant des gangs de rue Je suis noir et je t'avoue que moi, j'en ai rarement vu Mais j'ai connu des hommes qui se sont perdus dans le froid de la rue Je parlerai pas de gang, mais je parlerai de mauvais choix d'individus Blanc, noir, brun, jaune et même bleu Le crime organisé se fout de ton pour mon vieux Combien de morts va-t-il falloir avoir pour que le système nous donne l'heure juste Combien de morts va-t-il falloir avoir pour que le système nous donne l'heure juste Combien de morts va-t-il falloir avoir pour que le système nous donne l'heure juste C'est pas le citoyen qui est stupide, non Je viens d'un pays appelé Guyana, c'est en Sud-Amérique. Et où je suis venu en Guyana, c'est un pays de petit pays appelé Better for Wacton. Ma mère est venue ici au Canada en 1979. I was about uh, six or five at that time. Uh, she left us to come here to show us a better way. My grandmother was here. She left me, my brothers and sisters, which we were two boys and two girls in Guyana. Well, there's always been a, a, a Caribbean population in Canada and in Montreal, well, a black population, which goes back to, goes back to the days of the period of slavery in uh, uh, well, in this context in New France, uh, uh, what is now Quebec. Um, there have been smaller waves of Caribbean migrants coming to Canada for many years. Um, but probably the biggest wave, not probably, the biggest wave of Caribbean immigrants began in the, the mid to late 1950s, particularly in the 1960s, 1970s, um, and then through trickling through to the early 1980s where large numbers of Caribbean women and men came here for diverse reasons. Um, many women came here as part of the domestic scheme that um, allowed women to, uh, in which women worked in the homes of Canadian families, uh, after which uh, many of them stayed, either went on to become educated and work. Uh, many people just came here to work, given the shortage of labor in Canada, um, which still exists in a certain sense, where you have migrant laborers coming to work on farms and other places. Uh, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, many people came here to work kind of low-skilled jobs. Um, large numbers of Caribbean women and men came here to work as educators and professionals. So it's been a range of people that have migrated here over the years and for different reasons. Um, I think one of the other things that's important to point out is that uh, many of the people that came here in the 1960s and 70s and 80s uh, came here under circumstances in which they were forced to leave their families at home. But the other thing I think that is also important to, is to think about the relationship between Canada and the Caribbean, because uh, often that relationship uh, in terms of migrants is portrayed as people coming here from the Caribbean to take Canadian jobs, um, when it's often the case that they were filling jobs that Canadians either could not fill for, the, for a lack of professional laborers, uh, or also did not want to do, which is still the case. Right, Migrant workers come here from the Caribbean to work on farms doing hard labor on um, uh, on farms because uh, uh, many Canadians do not want to do that work. They come here and they're not paid very well in relation to, you know, by Canadian standards and their conditions are often not, uh, um, you know, compared to what are considered normal working conditions in a Canadian context, their, their conditions are very difficult. Uh, 
one other point I think is very important is that when you think about Caribbean laborers or Caribbean workers, Caribbean people coming here to work, they're coming here from a context of underdevelopment in the Caribbean, which is not unrelated to uh, Canada's economic relationship to the Caribbean. The case of Jamaica and Guyana, for example, um, which directly connects to Montreal, uh, Alcan, which is a company that makes aluminum foil, uh, a major company on the world market, um, much of its bauxite, the raw material that is used to make aluminum foil, has historically come from Jamaica, no longer from Jamaica because it's been mined, uh, it, it was mined out of business basically, um, and Guyana. Right? So these are two places in the Caribbean context where raw materials, as, as an example, were mined from those countries using local labor, and uh, which created, which, which um, in terms of profit, earned millions and billions of dollars right, for these corporations, uh, Alcan being one of them, and the major one in the Canadian context. Um, uh, and without contributing in a dramatic way to those local economies in those contexts. So uh, it's part of a way of seeing the, how the economies of the Caribbean and Canada are tied in ways that for want of jobs in that context, people come here to work. Right? So it's not just that people are coming here looking for jobs and looking for handouts. Uh, Canada has been benefited dramatically from its relationship to the Caribbean. Uh, the same can be said of Canadian banks historically. Uh, where uh, uh, Canadian banks, like the Royal Bank, as an example, has been benefited tremendously and has a long-standing historical relationship in the Canadian context. And it's a little-known fact that, uh, in many respects, Canadian banks have actually been more dominant in the Caribbean context, and not just in the Anglophone Caribbean, but uh, you know, up until the Cuban Revolution, also in Cuba, also in the Dominican Republic and other parts of the Caribbean. And me being the second oldest, I did most of the hard work, the more label, labor to help my family out. And as much as I did things, a lot of things weren't right. I was very much abused. The family that I was left with, they physically, verbally, and mentally abused me as a child. And um, things didn't get better for me. I got myself into a lot of trouble as a kid, without a father, without a mother in my life. I got myself into violence. Kids tried to hurt me. Um, I lost a, a young sister just before I come to this country. I saw her got murdered by the family member I was staying with. It was very difficult for me to express myself because I was taken away before seeing the body get buried. I ended up lashing out in society. I ended up lashing out in schools. Things didn't go the way how I taught. I couldn't speak French or English like the other French kids and English kids. My tongue was very much broken, so people didn't understand what I was saying and I didn't understand what they were saying. So there was a lot of violence verbally and physically where I couldn't express myself and didn't find understanding how to express myself. Going from school to school with these troubles, it didn't help me because I didn't have nobody to look up to. The lives of younger black women and men, youth, who have found themselves in a kind of hostile environment in this society, that in many respects, many of them have become sort of refuse of the society and live what has been described as wasted lives. Now, not of their own doing, but because they've arrived in a context in which um, their presence is unwanted, in, especially in large numbers, um, is um, seen as, uh, their presence is seen as a threat to the Canadian way of life. Um, unlike other groups that migrate here who happen to be white, um, their very presence is visible. And even in terms of their relationship to the wider society, right? Um, as seen as uh, literally physically, you know, physically changing 
the makeup of the society? Well, racial profiling is something that's endemic, I guess, to city life in Montreal in terms of black communities and also in terms of the Filipino communities. Generally, in terms of uh, a visible minorities, it's something that has existed for an extremely long time in this city, and it's just very tangible. If you actually are spending time uh, living and working in, in communities of color, you can really see the huge effect that it actually has on people's lives. Like, there's statistics that can describe things for you. Like, um, black people are two times more likely to be arrested than anybody else in Quebec, and four times more likely to be stopped and having questions asked to them, arrest for identification and things like this. So uh, that sounds bad on a statistical level, but if you actually think about what that means in terms of the way that racial profiling actually occurs, it's so much in terms of um, policing people's access to public space. Youth are learning firsthand what violence looks like and what injustice looks like from the very society that's supposed to be representing them and taking care of them. Some youth respond by feeling really angry, which is an anger that I think is extremely justified and I think that we actually need to give a lot of value to because it's a really human reaction to being dehumanized on a day-to-day -day level like this. And I think that some of the other things that happen is it actually just starts to, um, to affect people so much that they don't see any alternative and you start to see also just this hopelessness and this acceptance of uh, the way that this happens. Years later on, I found myself with somebody I fall in love with in school. It was my valedictorian, my first baby mother, the first woman I, I fall in love with. We lasted 14 years. We have a son together. He's 16 years old now. I'm very proud of him as much as I, I haven't had a chance to be a good father for him because of the past and how things have played out on me as being a father. I've been intoxicated for four years, 2004. I was locked down for quite some time. I came out 2006. I've seen the light, being inside the jail, away from the people I love. Having to know that that's not what I want of myself, and to be away for so long, it made me change. Young black men and young blacks in general represent a disproportionate number in the entire prison system, right? in the legal justice system. Right? Because they're living in a society that is hostile to their presence and has not willingly made a place for their presence in this society. The communities of color aren't alone, and teenagers of color aren't alone in the fact that they are prone to shoplifting and getting into small fights and maybe selling dime bags of weed on the corner, this kind of thing. It's not as if it's something that exists only in communities of color. It's just that because there's so much more surveyed, there's so much more surveillance in terms of the communities that they're living in is that a lot of things that we see as like problems with youth of color are actually just general societal problems that youth who are acting out uh, take part in. Because these youth are so much likely to be arrested and to be incarcerated and to end up going through the judicial system so early, we see it as a problem of youth of color instead of just seeing it as a problem of criminalizing our youth. Not that there's more youth criminals, but that they're turned into criminals because they're, because they're youth of color, because they're black. So the federal government is spending $3 billion, more than $3 billion, to construct 22 new provincial prisons. They're expanding 17 provincial prisons, and they're expanding 34 of the federal prisons. And they're passing all this new legislation to fill those beds. So one of the big ones that just got a lot of news was Bill C-10. Uh, Bill C-10 raises the mandatory minimums for a whole bunch of different sentences and also makes it harder for people to get out on parole. So if you're inside and you're trying to get out on parole and you get denied parole, now you have to wait a year or more to see the board again before you can get out. Um, they've also changed it so that if you're out on parole and the police pick you up, they don't have to talk to your parole officer before they throw you back in prison. So a lot of laws like this are changing in order to fill the beds that the federal government is building in these prisons. Since I came out 2006, I've been a new man. I've got two wonderful sons with a new woman. They're the star of my eyes. I also have two other sons that are hers, that are also are mine. I'm a father to four other kids, and I'm very happy and glad that somebody loved me for who I am. Because in the past, I didn't have love, and I didn't know who I was. So I embraced this opportunity with this new life. And the kids, they mean so much to me as being a father, the joy they bring when I come home at work or come home from a stressful day. And I'm so glad that I have that chance to make up, 
you know, to them and make up to myself to be a father again. Yeah, um, coming out wasn't easy for me. It, it was something that I thought it was going to go beautiful because I've served some time. And unfortunately, while we were together, 2009, the immigration came and visit, visit me at my home. And they let us know that um, I'm going to be de going to be deported. It was very hard for me because I uh, served time inside um, Bordeaux, RDP. I even got moved to Quebec because the, the population in the jail was too much people. So I spent 12 months or eight months in Quebec, which it was extremely more hard because there's no indica indigent canteen. There's no really help. And we're set when uh, you don't have nobody, family members, to come so far to give you help or to give you uh, love or attention. It, you become more suppressed. And that had happened to me while I was inside. And coming out and facing this, this pain again, you know, knowing the fact that I'll be taken away from my family and I don't know when I'm coming back or what my life is going to be like. I felt, I felt lost. I felt also unpunished for two or three more times because I've been inside. And since I've come out, I haven't done nothing wrong to really show society that um, I'm that person who I was once. And it really hurts me that I've worked so hard. I've taken programs. I've got more involved in my community, in my church. So the idea of double punishment um, is that you're being penalized once your legal system and then once your immigration system. Um, it applies for non-citizens, so permanent residents, uh, refugee claimants, refugees, um, anyone who doesn't fit the, the category of, non of citizenship, um, who's been in jail for six months or more um, through a federal crime. Um, this was implemented in 2001 by um, by the liberals they replaced a 25 year old immigration regime with the immigration and refugee protection act um and they included a section that talks about um a serving time in jail um and then facing deportation as a consequence immigration minister jason kenney stated that immigrants who non-citizens who face more than six months in jail um will be deported immediately as soon as they come out et je trouve que c'est pas juste ce que le gouvernement y pense puis comment il agit parce qu'il faut donner quand même une deuxième chance à quelqu'un que il a quand même vécu 30 années ici au Canada puis je sais pas pourquoi il décide maintenant même pour déporter tous les immigrants que au moins il a gardé sa paix tu sais il a pas rien fait de mal il a pas fait le vol qualifié il a pas frappé quelqu'un il a tout respecté qu'est-ce qu'il fallait depuis que moi et lui on était ensemble il a pas fait de vol non plus alors, je trouve ça vraiment injuste comment le gouvernement y pense. Alors, parce que là, pour toutes les personnes qui ont, ils sont bien en, en leur couple, en famille, tout ça, il faut donner quand même une deuxième chance de, de remettre leur vie en, en valeur encore plus. So the government isn't just building prisons, they're also building immigration detention centers. So there's a thing that happens where people get out of a prison if they've done time and get taken across the street in Montreal, across the street literally to the immigration detention center to face deportation. Um, and I think those two facilities fit together in this way of trying to control people, trying to force people out of this country, trying to keep people under surveillance. There's a lot of connections between CSIS and the police in terms of watching people who are out on parole or watching people who are without papers or waiting deportation. All of that kind of stuff fits together in this broader picture of trying to control people and trying to surveil people. That means is that even if people have grown up here with their entire families who are maybe at different levels of achieving citizenship, that um, just for being convicted of what is termed serious criminality, even though that's the seriousness of that criminality is not necessarily connected to what we might actually consider to be serious or threatening or extreme violence, say. Um, so then you see a large amount of people being taken away from their families and sent actually back to places that they have never spent any time, that they don't know, that are not their homes. So in terms of being given a second chance, which is something that we see as how the Canadian justice system functions, this is not true for people who don't have their full citizenship, even if they live here and all their families are here and their lives are here. 
Right? So we almost have two categories of non-citizens, those who are citizens but become non-citizens in terms of how they are treated, and those who are not citizens officially in terms of their papers, right? who are not only treated as non-citizens but you know, have been forced to leave the country as quote-unquote non-Canadians. Around just before Christmas, they called us in and let us know that um, the decision was made. Um, I'm going to be taken away from my family. They didn't um, explain when, but they asked me to collaborate and took some pictures for a passport, which I, I have done. I've been waiting. My heart, my life has been in limbo. I can't drink. I can't eat. Most of the times, it's very hard for me to sleep. You know, with so much stress in my kids, it's hard for me to even sometimes look at my kids because I don't know when I'll be coming back or what can happen to me. You know, it's really, it's really hurting me to know that I've been inside and I've come outside and it's been five, six years and I'm going to be taken away from my family. It's a little sour feeling for me to really say I'm somebody now, you know, but I still believe, you know, that I'm somebody but it's really hard when the government, they don't want to accept you as somebody. They always want to see you as a number or a file. C'est sûr que ça va affecter parce que les enfants, ils sont déjà attachés avec leur père. Puis, euh, alors avec tout ça, ça va vraiment faire la peine à eux. Ils vont voir que le, leurs pères ne seront plus là pour eux. Puis moi, ça va plus affecter pour moi parce que quand je vais me lever le matin... On est toujours habitué à faire euh, euh, beaucoup de choses ensemble, en famille. Puis là, je vais être tout seul avec mes quatre enfants. Alors, ça dure un peu. Reality for me is here, you know. Came here August 23rd, 1983. You know, I'm born December, December 1973. Guyana is not an easy place. Uh, uh, parts of Trinidad are not an easy place. And if you're going back as an adult to a place that you left as a child without um, a certain level of education, right, a certain level of uh, professional experience, and basically arriving in a place, uh, in a context that um, is home but not home, right, or was home but is no longer home, um, uh, um, it's not a tenable situation. You're, it's like sending any other Canadian from their home to a foreign environment in many respects and asking them to begin their lives from scratch. Aux États-Unis, en 1996, le gouvernement a adopté une loi pour euh, faire euh, des déportations massives euh, de toutes les personnes qui n'ont pas la citoyenneté et qui ont euh, un casier criminel. Et euh, cette loi-là a eu un impact euh, pour euh, beaucoup de pays parce que euh, beaucoup de gens, bon, il y, y, y a toutes sortes de gens qui se sont retrouvés à être déportés, des gens, par exemple, qui avaient, euh, euh, qui avaient été condamnés pour euh, alcool au volant, mais il y a aussi euh, des criminels euh, endurcis, disons, comme euh, des gens qui ont, euh, qui ont goûté euh, à la vie de gang euh, à Los Angeles et, euh, et qui sont devenus comme euh, des, des criminels euh, d'habitude et qui sont euh, déportés dans des pays où, ce que, euh, disons, euh, les, euh, les forces policières ne sont vraiment pas organisées pour euh, dealer avec euh, la criminalité euh, sophistiquée. Et ça a eu pour effet de, comment dire, d'augmenter le taux de criminalité euh, dans certains pays. C'est le cas du Honduras, où euh, l'apparition du phénomène euh, des maras euh, est une conséquence directe de la politique de déportation des États-Unis. Sur la police, une grosse job. commission des droits.
Ce qui est intéressant, c'est que euh, les autorités d'immigration euh, n'ont rien fait avec euh, Danny Villanueva en termes d'entreprendre des procédures euh, d'expulsion. Il euh, n'y a rien qui a été fait euh, jusqu'en janvier euh, 2010, donc pratiquement quatre ans après le plaidoyer de culpabilité en avril 2006. En janvier 2010, donc, euh, l'Agence des services frontaliers du Canada euh, convoque Danny Villanueva devant la Commission d'immigration et de statut de réfugié. Et, et là, ils ont demandé que Danny soit expulsé du Canada, soit interdit de territoire. Et ça, c'est euh, vraiment, ça veut dire d'être banni à vie pour le restant de ses jours euh, du Canada, de ce pays dans lequel il est arrivé alors qu'il avait l'âge de, de 12 ans. Et cette euh, procédure d'expulsion débute dans le contexte où il y a l'enquête du coroner André Perrault sur les causes et circonstances du décès de Freddy Villanueva. Donc, lorsque Danny Villanueva est convoqué devant la commission d'immigration, c'est à quelques semaines avant le début prévu de son témoignage devant euh, l'enquête euh, du coroner à ce moment-là. Commission des droits de la personne, mandat du protecteur du citoyen, ministre de la sécurité publique, décision de ne pas porter d'accusation. Euh, des euh, organismes qui ont documenté certains phénomènes, comme par exemple des jeunes euh, qui se font expulser des États-Unis et qui arrivent euh, par exemple à, à San Pedro de Sula et, euh, et qui se font euh, assassiner euh, peu de temps après par euh, des groupes, euh, des, des véritables escadrons de la mort qui patrouillent dans les rues, euh, qui vont voir euh, les jeunes gens qui viennent d'être expulsés des États-Unis qui, qui, et qui vont les voir, qui leur disent euh, « est-ce que tu est as des tatous Enlève ton chandail, on veut voir si tu as des tatous » et ainsi de suite. Et euh, lorsque la personne a le malheur d'avoir un tatou euh, sur elle, peu importe que ce soit un tatou de, de, avec le, le, le nom de sa blonde ou quoi que ce soit, la personne est assassinée euh, tout simplement comme ça. Donc, euh, c'est clair pour nous que euh, la déportation de Danny Villanueva, c'est euh, une peine de mort, c'est une peine capitale là, pour lui. I'm 38 years old now and I found my home. I found my life, you know. And I Having a relationship now with my mom, I finally feel important. I finally see the mistakes that I've made and why, why I didn't, you know, make things better. And it's now that I see things going better, that I want better and I can do better, you know. Nicholas's situation is one of many. This has become almost endemic, and it's part of a social phenomenon, it's part of a, a government that's reneged on its responsibility, that has used the, the labor, and in some cases, the education and professional experience, etc of the families, parents, of people like Nicholas. And when their services or everything that comes with their services, when their family is no longer needed, right, they become expendable. And there are many people like Nicholas who have become expendable and therefore become, quote unquote, somebody else's problem. Pas se mentir, le déni ici, ça date pas d'hier. Regardez le traitement réservé aux nations premières. Pourquoi devrait-on espérer avec tant d'impunité La majorité visible a l'impression dérangée. Si t'es si ouvert d'esprit, mais donc nos noms sur tes boulevards. On veut exister pas seulement dans tes corridors et couloirs. Peut-être que si vous nous verrez aussi comme vos enfants. C'est pourquoi notre Freddy Villanueva est si important. Hein? Combien de morts va-t-il falloir avoir pour que le système nous donne l'heure juste hein? Combien de morts va-t-il falloir avoir pour que le système nous donne l'heure juste Combien de morts va-t-il falloir avoir pour que le système nous donne l'heure juste hein? C'est pas le citoyen qui est stupide, non, je crois que c'est le système qui rouille hein? Combien de morts va-t-il falloir avoir pour que le système nous donne l'heure juste Il va falloir avoir pour que le système 
voir, ça serait, tu rentres n'importe qui chez nous, il y en a un dans ta famille qui fait une gaffe, c'est toute ta famille qui retourne à la maison. 